Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Agribusiness Academy podcast. Thank you for your feedback and thoughts on the Indigo Agriculture case study. We've taken a lot of that on board and we'll continue to do so as we progress this series. Today we're going to look at Brandless, a company based in California. On first impression, that's an odd name for a company, but hopefully this case study will explain exactly why that name makes perfect sense, or some sense at least. A San Francisco startup launched this week and is trying to disrupt the nearly $600 billion grocery industry. Online retailer Brandless sells everything from organic peanut butter to fluoride-free toothpaste and cooking knives. And all of its products cost only $3. The company sells around 200 household and food items and says it cuts out supermarkets and traditional marketing in order to bring savings directly to customers. That extract is from CBS's This Morning show uh, in 2017, shortly after Brandless launched on the back of Series B funding. Since then, and as we'll discuss in this podcast, the company has grown in strength and raised $240 million in 2018 as Series C funding. A note for our listeners around the world that $3 is approximately £2.25 or €2.60. Hopefully for currencies beyond that, you'll know the conversion. The wonderful thing about Brandless's proposition is that it's super simple to describe, and I don't need to go much beyond CBS's introduction. But let's start by reviewing the need for a company like Brandless and the problem that they're aiming to address. First, let's hear from Tina Sharkey, one of the co-founders, in that same CBS This Morning interview. Well, the way in which goods are bought and sold in this country are broken in that CPG companies don't actually have consumers. Their customers are the stores. So the products are made in the factories. They then go through lots of inefficiencies to actually get to that market. And by the time it gets to you, you're paying so much markup that we've decided to cut out of the process. Here's Tina again on Bloomberg. At Brandless, what he saw was that we can actually completely disrupt that supply chain and go direct to consumers and build direct relationships with consumers and use data and artificial intelligence and machine learning to actually create the products that people are looking for and de-risk all of the big sort of paradox of choice when there's way too many products out there. So what Brandless are addressing are these hidden costs that as consumers we pay for when we shop in supermarkets distribution, shelving, all the elements that the middleman incurs, and what brandless call a brand tax. Whilst Amazon attempt to tackle this problem by cutting out that middleman, brandless are going a step further by working directly with suppliers to deliver a collection of over 350 everyday essentials, focusing on high quality, and we'll talk about that, at an affordable price. I asked Dr. Vijay Danala where he thought Brandless sits within this wide spectrum of companies we talk about in the food and agribusiness sector. So what is Brandless? Is it a retailer? Uh, is it a CPG brand? Um, what is it? Um, to me, this is a supply chain company. You will understand more about it when you really understand the dilemmas that such a company um, uh, has to resolve to deliver its value proposition. We'll hear more from Dr. Nala again later. Brandless's philosophy for production is just what matters. That is what Brandless call the gold standard within any category. This is the opposite of retailers delivering a range of the same product, 12 different kinds of quinoa, as Brandless uses as an example. Here I'd like to add some context, leaning on our digital learning library, to build a broader picture of retail. This is Dr. David Hughes discussing Aldi and Lidl, discount supermarkets in Europe, Australia and beyond. You'll hear that when you create a high quality product, that can be enough to lure consumers away from brands. If you take Aldi, around the world, their two destination products will be chocolate, all comes out of Austria, globally, absolutely top end chocolate at a price which is just beggars, how on earth can it be that cheap? And uh, secondly, um, nappies, as, as uh, the Brits say, or diapers, as uh, uh, Americans would say. In a market, let's take Australia, where they haven't been, Aldi hasn't been long. On the wire, they'll have chocolates, really good and cheap, and also nappies, diapers for the baby that uh, are excellent and half the price as of Pampers, the, the, main, the main brand. They'll go to buy. While they're there, they'll say, oh, I might buy this and this and this. And so, and they slowly expand <laughs> their basket size. 
And before you know it, they're doing their shop there. I can certainly vouch as a new parent that we've gone out of our way to buy Audi's baby products. Uh, here's an important caveat from a sustainability perspective, again taken from Dr. David Hughes. What's going to, uh, I, mean, I think, accelerate this online grocery is the use of technology, whether it's sort of drone driven, whether it's sort of no driver vehicles. I mean, clearly, what we have at the moment in most countries that have got a, such a surge in online retailing, not just grocery, but online retailing in general, I think it's unsustainable. There are more white vans scurrying around the, the, the roads of the UK, and it's not right. I mean, I think that's not sustainable from an environmental point of view, from a damage to the road point of view, and it's going to change. They will just get much, much more efficient. How it's done, I'm not sure, but technology will sort of sort it out. We'll see where technology takes us in terms of delivery, but it's something that we need to think about and be conscious of in our decision making. That said, this presentation from Dr. Hughes wasn't delivered in the context of brandless, and you could certainly argue that the reduction of distribution miles in retail will offset the delivery drivers rather than being an additional environmental burden. Whilst it provides context, I think it's worth noting that from a consumer side, brandless is probably challenging the need for choice rather than strictly competing on a cost basis. Whilst there are certainly products that are better value than premium brands, if we take brandless's word on the comparable quality. But you can also find products that are not as competitively priced as somewhere like Audi or Lidl. For many of our listeners, you might not have had a reason to visit brandless.com, especially if you're outside of North America. Well, since the original CBS introduction that we heard, brandless have introduced a wider range of products and prices, largely choosing multiples of $3 as the entry point. As their community, as they refer to their customers, begin to experience their products, they're encouraged to subscribe to their purchases, much like we see within the Amazon model, those kind of recurring products. The striking part about all the products is the minimalistic packaging, particularly as a contrast to the bright colours, mascots and food photography we're used to seeing on our supermarket shelves. In many respects, this is the antithesis of what we're used to seeing, and it's a promise brandless make to its community. On its packaging, it has a name that describes the product, say, dish soap, a series of bullet points, or check marks as they call them, that bring through those just what matters points. For example, the purpose, so this dish soap removes grease, and the USP, so it's free from any dyes and is a non-toxic formula. The last part is a colour that represents the flavour or the ingredients, uh, and any trust mark or certifications as appropriate for the product. By producing and directly supplying the products, brandless are able to live up to that community tag that they've placed on their customers. They ask for feedback, give out recommendations, and rely on customers to guide them on what products to produce next. But what about the other side, the brands and the products that many of us have an affinity to? Lots of us would say that we only eat a certain type of cereal or sauce or confectionery. Ido Leffler, Brownless's co-founder, answers that point. At $3, it's quite an easy, there's no real barrier to entry to try. Mm -hmm. What we've done is actually compiled, we took every ketchup on the market and we actually tested it across uh, beta testers, mm -hmm. people that were coming in and trying. And our team of incredible curators chose the ones that people love the most. Mm -hmm. Whilst McKinsey Research tells us that 58% of people would be willing to switch brands, Brandless's proposition is particularly based on millennials and younger audience who they believe have less brand loyalty. A quick YouTube search will show you the amount of influencers and filmmakers who are taking the time to review Brandless's products, whether it's beauty, food or some of the homeware stuff. And we know that these people produce videos based on what people want to see, where they'll get views. Some of these videos have had over 100,000 views. And whilst that's quite modest in views these days, uh, let's not forget that we're still talking about a food and agribusiness startup here. One of the videos introduced Brandless as a self-proclaimed Procter & Gamble for millennials. I couldn't find anywhere that Brandless had said that themselves, and maybe they've moved on from that messaging. But we certainly know that this audience, and indeed their younger counterparts, will very much be on the mind of the multinationals. AdAge and Bloomberg both reported last year that Procter & Gamble had tried to trademark what they called millennial phrases, such as WTF. Also worth noting is that Pampers is a Procter & Gamble brand, facing those challenges from the Audi nappies that we heard about before. 
But you're betting fun. that millennials are less brand loyal than Correct. someone like myself. Well, not only are we betting on that, but 78% of millennials have said they don't want to buy the products that they grew up with. They don't want their parents' government, they don't want their parents' institutions, and they don't want to go with the brands. They don't represent their values. They want to eat organic. They want to eat natural. They want to work with a company that's socially responsible. They want the transparency. And so Brandless is definitely a brand, but Brandless is reimagining what it means to be a brand based on authenticity, based on building a community with the people it serves, and based on transparency. Tina Sharkey again there. Reimagining what it means to be a brand. That's a fantastic insight that I think we can all ponder. I'm sure Brandless wouldn't say that they've perfected that notion, but they're certainly giving consumers and professionals something to think about. Speaking of things to ponder, I asked Dr. Vijay Andanala, who is leading the Food and Agribusiness Management Program here at Agribusiness Academy, to give you some dilemmas to hone your thinking on this business model. This is a huge part of our digital learning and coaching program as learners solve these kind of dilemmas in groups with expert guidance and coaching. But you can have a go at trying to solve some of these dilemmas uh, and apply that thinking in your own business or career. What are some of the dilemmas that such a business faces? So the professionals working within the business are the supply chain partners that are servicing this business. What kind of uh, uh, things they need to be aware about is, is one of the things that excites me a lot uh, in terms of uh, dealing with this case, because it really has to take care of its whole supply chain to be able to deliver the value proposition. So uh, if I have to get into the uh, dilemma, some of them, of course, uh, we can look at all the dilemmas as we um, get it, uh, uh, in detail uh, within the modules. But if I have to just say some of the dilemmas to give a flavor of, um, of uh, how challenging uh, it is to run and deliver value for this value proposition. Um, so uh, a, a very straightforward dilemma is which product categories to add to the portfolio, right? So why is that important? Because if you don't have, if you do not have enough product categories, then you do not become interesting for your customers. Uh, you um, may be the cheapest option for some products, but you don't solve uh, all the needs. So that means um, that um, you do not give enough opportunity for all your customers to order your products, right? So that's why adding new product, uh, new product categories is super important. Then within those product categories, which product lines uh, should you carry? Because that is not a very straightforward decision of uh, uh, picking up all the products in that category and stocking it because it has to fit uh, the final price point of um, $3, right? So uh, can it fit the final price point of uh, $3 is an important uh, uh, dilemma to, to resolve before even uh, you know, getting further into making a business case and getting further into the in, into the um, uh, um, into the process of um, uh, building up the supply chain. So when it comes to when the first two questions are addressed, then the next critical dilemma is how do you work out the supply selection and engagement process, right? So that's the key um, factor. So here, why is that a challenging process? Is because they should they should uh, tick all the boxes uh, of their uh, digital capabilities because you're primarily a digital company and the whole the supply chain is kind of digital driven right from the consumer all the way up to the um, uh, up to the uh, distribution and further upstream right so the digital capabilities are very critical the quality is very important uh, right whether it is um, a food or non food product uh, safety is very important, uh, definitely more important for a food product. Reliability, reliability of delivery, reliability of uh, quality um, uh, and safety, all these things uh, 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 related to reliability are very important. Scale is very important because if you are a business of such, uh, such kind, um, you have to be prepared for scale. So you have to have suppliers and supply capabilities that can scale as the business scales, as the demand scales, I would say. And then finally, the price, that is a very important factor, right? So all these capabilities um, have to be possessed by suppliers and they should be committed to your um, value chain as well. So these tend to be different um, for different categories and that makes it uh, super, super difficult for um, 
for the talent that is working within this company, uh, you need to kind of more or less have entrepreneurial people working to realize this you know, supply selection process. So now how do you uh, then the next dilemma um, could be and would be um, how do you manage inbound and outbound uh, logistics very efficiently? So you have uh, selected your categories, you've selected your product lines, uh, you have uh, um, got to uh, uh, finished up the biggest hurdle of selecting your suppliers. Now, how do you really hold, uh, how do you make the whole system uh, run, right? So different products have different packaging needs. They have different storage needs like cold chain versus no cold chain um, and the distribution, uh, other distribution infrastructure demands, the type of trucks, the type of packages um, and, and stuff like that. So uh, this is a very important. And then we know um, in the context of uh, uh, delivery businesses, um, we know the loss mile uh, challenges while um, uh, most of the practical challenges of delivery have been fixed the economics are still uh, you know kind of debated so that's another challenge so now if you have overcome all of this then how do you scale such a business into other markets because you have to uh, be replicating um, such a supply chain uh, in other markets um, and that's not going to be very uh, straightforward right so there has to be consistency um, in the type of products that you deliver um, the quality of the products and safety of the products and all that stuff comes in again so this is this is a really really exciting um, business case from a learning perspective but more importantly uh, every business can take away so many um yeah, so many uh, lessons uh, from looking at um, this particular uh, business and this is a very uh, this is a, a harvard business case and the business is not very um very old it's just uh, launched in 2017 so uh, and we explain the insights from this business within our learning and interactive sessions and let the learners um, and professionals uh, on the program work out solutions in the groups so that um, they can action the rich learnings from this case that is the case of brandless to their own business certainly some interesting dilemmas to consider there and of course if you want to work those through with us you'd be very welcome to join our program and you can find out more on our website at agribusiness.academy so what next for brandless i'll leave you with tina sharkey on bloomberg what are your plans for international expansion or does that come now or later? Um, I would say that comes later, but there's no doubt that with Brandless and with the product market fit we've seen here and with our muses from around the world that really inspire us, uh, we're building a global brand and more importantly, a global movement. Thanks for listening. See you next time.